The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Hello and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick. My partner, Malik Hill. Starting to get to the second week of August. Getting even closer and closer to football season. So we're into all the training camp talk, news and notes. Um, another college football preview. Um, the NFL has made a statement about Deshaun Watson, basically. And uh, yeah, we are we're getting closer. Getting closer. Um, so quickly, I wanted to start with the NFL did decide, we talked about it last week, Deshaun Watson was getting suspended for six games um, as approved by the judge appointed by the NFL to handle the case. And the NFL said, no, that wasn't good enough. And they've appealed. They're looking at an indefinite uh, suspension, which would mean he would sit out this year. Um, and then they'd go from there to decide what else happens. Uh, so pretty big deal. I think it was probably probably needed. Uh, I think one reason was probably because of the backlash from people when they heard the six-game suspensions. I know a lot of people were not happy. didn't seem to make sense. We talked about it last week, like I said. Uh, so I think this is a good thing by the NFL, but it is, it's a bit awkward because they did this whole thing of trying to not be the ones that are making the decision to hopefully – mitigate some of these uh issues that they've had in the past with suspensions and things so interesting to see but i, th I think at the end of the day they made the right call yeah it's a. Uh, it's i don't know if it kind of goes against everything i said last week with them just doing what's good for them although it, it is kind of just them doing what's good for them because it's, it's to maintain their image and to make it seem like they're on the side of everything that's going on right now, which you, you there should be a longer suspension on Deshaun Watson, even though he hasn't been convicted of anything. Right. All things lead to it just being a bad situation. Right. So I agree with what they did, but I also have that feeling of they're, they're doing this for themselves for the most part. Right. To, to keep the image of the NFL in a certain light. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and then, like we said, there's been training camp stuff going on, and so we've we've gotten more and more news lately. So a couple of the ones we wanted to talk about, uh, George Pickens has been looking good for the Steelers, so we think that he's going to make that that starting three wide receivers. Yeah, they're they're saying he almost he has to prove it in preseason, but so far in camp, he's just been a highlight reel. Yeah, more than anybody. Whereas their other rookie, Kenny Pickett, is struggling a bit. And it looks like Mitch Trubisky is just going to take that job and maybe Pickett comes on at the end of the season. Maybe they just sit him down for a while, let him get used to the NFL, and then try to work him into their starting spot eventually. Um, Trey Lance, another one that a lot of people are interested with, uh, all the Jimmy G, nobody knows where he's going, what they're going to do with him. Uh, Trey Lance has looked really good at times, like kind of as advertised. And then there's been other times where he just doesn't look as good. And he looks like he's, I don't know, a subpar quarterback, I guess. But he does so much athletically that I think that can make up for it. But it's just something to watch as he's going to be their their full-time starter. So curious to see how that'll go. But he has shown that he has a, a little bit of a connection with Brandon Ayuk, which is interesting because Brandon Ayuk kind of got sat down last year for a little while. Uh, coach didn't like what he was doing. Now, apparently, they say he's put in a lot of work and he's looking a lot better, so that'll be another interesting thing to kind of watch, uh, especially with defense is going to be focusing on Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel, by the way, now that I think about it, just got paid. And yeah. 
at this point now he even says at one point there was reports that he didn't want to be like a, a tailback wide receiver combo thing. Now he says all those rumors are fake. It's hard to know who's right because the man just got paid now, so he could be just, you know, pleased with his money and now he's not gonna not gonna complain. Yeah, this it, it seemed like a kind of Jalen Ramsey in Jacksonville situation where he was making it loud and clear that he needed to get paid right. or else. Mm-hmm. And in Jacksonville, it clearly didn't work out here. Luckily, luckily for 49ers fans, yeah, they gave him what he wanted. Right. And then uh, out of the Seahawks camp, they're another team that's in the, in the running, supposedly, for maybe Jimmy G. Uh, but right now, Drew Locke, who they traded Russell Wilson for, of course, other pieces along with it, but... He's not beating out Geno Smith last year's backup who filled in for a lot of games. Um, Geno Smith looked pretty decent at times. He looked like a solid backup quarterback. Um, And Drew Locke's not beating that out. Makes me kind of nervous because you would have figured that Drew Locke might have been better for DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett because they're kind of like deep threat kind of guys. But if if you don't learn the system quick, quick enough and Geno Smith has been there for I think three years at this point, he knows the ins and out. He knows the receivers. I'm sure he he has great chemistry with DK, who just signed an extension, right? And Tyler Lockett. So if they're on the same page, and Drew Lock is trying to figure out how to get on the same page with those guys, probably overthrowing DK by like 20 yards. Yeah. And Tyler Lockett, it's it's a process. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not surprised Gino has the upper hand at this point. Yeah. And then uh, to another quarterback that's. Uh, supposedly figuring out his system to a title of Oh my goodness. I can't talk today. Tongue of Iloa, ladies and gentlemen. I've, uh, I've struggled Tua. all day with talking. <laughs> um, I know you don't know that, but it's been true. Um, he Tua has been, uh, playing really well and people are starting to get excited about the dolphins. Apparently hitting Tyreek Hill. Well, in stride. Um, Dolphins have been talking about using Tyreek Hill in different, different kinds of, uh, sets and things like that. And then, um, I know like one thing people were saying is that the Dolphins do this race at the end of every practice or whatever to see who's the fastest. And Tyreek Hill is one. I think they said every time, except for once where he most heard actually got him. Um, uh, but it's just interesting, kind of fun to watch. Um, especially when they have Jalen Waddle as well on that team. So they're they're a quick team. They're gonna be exciting. I'm I'm interested in the Dolphins, but I still don't believe in Tua necessarily. And their running I, back room is a mess. They they brought in some talent. Oh, well, they did, but they brought in some nice talent. I just start to get nervous when you got Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mostert, uh Sony Michelle, and then they still have Miles Gaskin technically, but they got like four all right yeah. running backs. So one of them is gonna lag behind yeah. but in today's game only a few teams have bell cow guys that are every down backs right you have to have at least three yeah that can rotate and play quality snaps so yeah, yeah. if and Raheem I, Mostert could stay healthy I think I'd be more excited but I I just don't believe that he can yeah and I I still have faith in Tua it's not as high as it was when he came into the league mm. but I still believe in the accuracy and I think he'll be much more accurate this year with the level of talent he has around him yeah and then the last one before we get to Lions, I got to bring up Daniel Jones because he's been over. Oh, there's one more, too. The two the two Twitter highlight guys have been Daniel Jones and Trevon Diggs. And not and <laughs> not in a good reason. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Jones, there's a Twitter clip out there. Very big miss on an out route. It, we kind of talked about it before the show. It looks like there was actually just some miscommunication. Yeah, the receiver kind of gave up on the route. Um, but, but either way, it looks really bad. He missed him by a mile. Yeah. Um, and then Trevon Diggs has been burned by every wide receiver on the Cowboys. Simi Fajoko is yeah. getting rave reviews mm-hmm. because he's been burning that young man. Yeah. But this, this is the thing. It's, it's been a social media war for the past like year mm-hmm. and very heated right now between Trayvon Diggs truthers yeah. and Trayvon Diggs haters. Mm-hmm. And we're more balanced in the in-between where – Yes, getting 11 picks as a rookie is incredible. Right. He deserves all the credit in the world. But when he wasn't picking off passes, he was getting picked on. Yeah. And he they targeted him every game because of that. Yeah. Now, because of his instincts and his ability, he was able to get a pick almost every other game. Yeah. 
I think yeah. people when you're a liability when you're not getting picks. Yeah, it's it's very it's weird. And people forget that like getting interceptions isn't always a skill. Like there is some luck involved. As much as I like Amani Aruarie, like his him being what he was third in interceptions in the league last year, it's pretty lucky. There's a lot that fell into his hands. Yeah. Now you got to make the catch, but at the same yeah. time, and I'm not saying Trevon Diggs is like a bad cornerback necessarily, but I think people think that he's like some generational. Crazy, yeah, he's some crazy athletic freak that can just go get uh, interceptions. I think it's just. He's very good at getting in the right spot at the right time. He's a bigger guy for a cornerback, so he can go attack at the point of the uh, at the yeah, ball. He has those receiver skills, right? So he can kind of compete um, at the point of the ball, and not a ton of cornerbacks can do that. So that also helps him. But again, he's not like some crazy fast corner that can just cover all this ground yeah, so the, fast. The true great corners are the ones that are locked down, mm -hmm. the ones that you barely target. And right. when you do, they make you pay. Yeah. He's not close to that yet. Mm -hmm. He has the elite instincts, but he has to keep building on those so he doesn't get burned right. all the time. And he canceled, I think, didn't he shut down his Twitter account yeah. because of all of this? Which, come on, man. You, yeah, makes it look worse. You, you know you know, some of this mm -hmm. is coming. Like, you, sh you should be able to handle it. Right. Just back it up when the season comes. Yeah. Also, I, I don't know if you remembered – the receiver problem in Dallas, yeah, is a, uh, it's 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 really it's creeping up on them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems like they're not going to target Odell or anybody else. I heard Odell won't be back until something like week seven or week eight oh, yeah. potentially, um, yeah. if somebody signs him. But they're they're down to Ceedee Lamb, who's their superstar, mm -hmm. and Noah Brown, who has less than ten catches in his career. Yeah, and Michael Gallup is still kind of recovering. He'll be back at some point in the season, but. Who knows when? So they're going to have to rely heavily on Dalton Schultz, too, which, I mean, he came up pretty big for them last year. Um, and then I'm assuming they're going to do even more crazy stuff with Zeke and Tony Pollard. I, I think Tony Pollard is going to be used a lot, mm -hmm. a lot as a slot guy, uh, just b being thrown all over the place. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to do stuff like that, which I, I think would be kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, those are – kind of the news and notes that we picked out from some of the camp stuff um and then of course the detroit lions episode one of hard knocks came out yesterday uh we both watched it this, uh, from a scale of one to ten how hyped did that first speech from dan campbell get you to just to start the episode which one was that the one There's where a lot of the one where he mentioned one butt cheek in the in the oh, three toes, yeah. uh, you know, that, and we're gonna kill, and we're gonna take you out. Uh, that, and that, that, one, that that was a funny part of it, but the rest of it was it was pretty inspiring. It was pretty inspiring. Yeah, and then when he like kind of pointed out the going rules. into the deep water and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, that's you're right. You're right. Um, I would say uh, seven or eight. That's just not because, bad. It's not just bad. because like you, you, you threw me off when you're talking about toes. And, <laughs> yeah. One butt cheek and stuff like that, yeah, you know, whatever. Just get to the point. But yeah, that's that's what makes him Dan Campbell, though. He, yeah, he kind of goes off sometimes, but you right. see the passion. Yeah, and I I think the biggest takeaway for me was kind of alluding to that where they kept bringing up like for the Lions, it seems like a lot of the guys they can just be themselves yeah. and they're cool with that and they accept that, and I think that's really that's really good for chemistry and. Yeah, it it was just so fun. Um, I was telling you earlier that the Pat McAfee show, they were they brought on like the producers from HBO that made the Lions Hard Knocks episodes and the guy that's going to produce the in season Cardinals episodes. But they said that they've gotten some of the best footage they've ever had from any Hard Knocks season with the Lions so far, which is exciting, and it's a way to show like other people outside of. Michigan, what the Lions are about, and that's kind of cool. Again, I don't want to get too excited about the whole deal that they look good and they're fun to watch. I still want them to kind of struggle this year, to be mm -hmm. honest, but it, it's just nice to see, and it, it's it's a cool aspect that I think everybody can kind of get behind the Lions and be like, oh, yeah, this is a fun team. I can get behind this team. I want them to do well at some point. 
What was your highlight, would you say? So, uh, besides Hutch singing Billie Jean, that was... the I, I love the fact that they included it from the jump, mm-hmm. where he messed it up, got booed by the whole team, had to close his eyes, get refocused, mm-hmm. and then just put on a put on a performance. Yeah. But, yeah, them, them just going into Hutch's whole hometown kid, hometown hero thing, and seeing, just seeing his ability. Mm-hmm. We we discussed before the draft and after the draft that he he was the most complete defensive prospect in the draft, and he he showed a lot of it in that first episode. It's clear that he still has a lot to learn, getting chipped by Hawkinson in that one play, mm-hmm. something that he never really experienced in college, and him going against Penay Sewell on a daily basis is going to do nothing but help him. Yeah, I love the fact that they have that competition. And seeing him get Pene Sewell a few times mm-hmm. with his his ability to power rush and speed rush, yeah, it's, it's it was really encouraging to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see more because in the past, Hard Knocks and most first episodes, they usually show like more of the rest of the rookie class. Yeah, this one they really focused on Hutch, besides showing Malcolm Rodriguez right do his dance, but mm-hmm. yeah, it was mainly a spotlight on him. And right. I, I love the coaches thing too. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of the hard part too is like you would love to see Jamison Williams but there's not going to really be anything of Jamison Williams except maybe like some rehab type stuff but um because I think he would have been a fun one to watch for that kind of stuff but I liked watching uh, in the few clips that we saw DeAndre Swift looked really good um and then I I think the other one that I again that I didn't want to drink the juice on but watching Jared Goff throw it to DJ Chark that was fun to watch. Shark made some really nice catches, uh, a nice diving catch towards the end of the episode. And, um, yeah, it, it's just a fun thing, I think, especially for us to just be able to watch to get ready for the, the NFL season. And then maybe this is <laughs> maybe this being on Hard Knocks is going to be the, the uh, highlight of the season, unfortunately. But at least they were there. And at least, like I said, they could get a bigger fan base behind them after watching this like how can you not watch this watch this team or watch this show and not enjoy the lions like our oc and dc are arguing up and down the field during training camp yeah and like i don't know it's just fun it's just the level of competition and passion and fire is it's it's great to see yeah and again like you said kind of jamal williams people are gonna like this guy and he's he's fun now I would say I've heard some people bring it up that like maybe Jamal got a little too deep because he's talking about the season and half those guys that he's talking to in that that huddle aren't going to be on the team. <laughs> so maybe it's a little pre- premature to be bringing up the season, but uh I, I still like it at the at the end of the day. It was it was fun to watch. Um and hopefully like you said, hopefully they get into a little more personality of individual players uh, as they go on some of the young guys. And the way Hard Knocks usually does it, they'll bring in a rookie, and then they'll end up talking to some guy that's eventually going to get cut at the end of the season. So, should be should be fun, should be interesting. Okay, now on to the the main meat and potatoes of today's Great. episode. Love the love the catchphrase. Uh, We're gonna have T-shirts eventually. Okay, <laughs> meat and potatoes. So, uh, back into our college football preview. And after this one, we got the two big dogs left, SEC and Big Ten. Those will be the next two weeks. Today, though, we have the ACC. A To me, has always been a weird conference because I think of ACC and I think basketball. Basketball being my main sport, that's immediately what I think of in the ACC. But, like, they've had some teams over the years kind of break through. They've had a couple teams – Recently, like North Carolina has kind of surprised some some people. So it, it seems like somebody out of the ACC always kind of fights through and figures out a way to make it big time. And especially this year, I'm sure you're going to talk about it, but like some of these teams have gotten some pretty big recruits. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. So Malik, take it away. So the Atlantic Coast Conference a conference that is in flux with all this realignment going on. Notre Dame plays a somewhat ACC schedule, but they're not in the conference. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows if they're going to join eventually. 
But looking in, looking at it into this year, this is what it looks like. We're going to start with a team that had a ton of hype going into last year. I hyped them up just like everybody. I had full belief that DJ Uyunglele was going to be the next after Deshaun Watson, after Trevor Lawrence. I believed he was the next in line to just pop and be super duper special. But it didn't happen that way. <laughs> last year was a surprise retooling season for Clemson. And people didn't see it coming. Uh, DJ Uyunglele had nine touchdowns to ten picks. Mm-hmm. Completion percentage in the 50s. He could never get into a real rhythm. The receiving core was nothing but 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big-bodied receivers that weren't, like, exceptional route runners. So the chemistry never developed on the offensive side. They only had a few guys that really broke out, like Will Shipley, who was a freshman running back, but it never came together. Mm-hmm. And the defense was on the field so much because the offense wasted opportunities that they could never get into a major rhythm either besides their talent. So new season with Clemson. Dabo Sweeney returns. One key piece Luke leaves. Defensive coordinator Brent Venables, who I talked about last week, Mm -hmm. is now the head coach at Oklahoma. And Dabo Sweeney made a decision that is kind of split in the Clemson fan base. Yeah. He decided instead of going for a big-name defensive coordinator, a guy that most of the country knows, he's so loyal and he sticks within his program, and this goes with, like, transfer players too and coaches. He just elevated a guy within the program. And the guy that he elevated is named Wes Goodwin, a guy that's been in the program for a few years, has been rising up the ranks, and Dabo just gave him the keys. Mm -hmm. and believes in the young guy's talent to coach the defense who knows if it'll backfire, but Dabo has, he's gotten by all these years and excelled bringing the guys up through the, through his system and coaching and players. Yeah. So we'll have to see how it happens. All the talent is there Mm -hmm. on the D line. They, they might have the best D line in the country and it's led by Brian Brzee. He wears number one. He's like six, four, 300. He's fast. He's strong. He's a defensive tackle, but he can line up at DN. He's just a monster. He's going to wreak a lot of havoc. Like I said, DJ Oyungalele comes back. He's lost, I think, about 25 to 30 pounds. He was around 260 last season, which is really big. Right. But he's used to carrying a lot of weight. He's down to like 235, 230 now. Mm -hmm. They say he's more mobile. They say he's more confident in the system and that he's starting to sharpen up his decision-making skills. Now, over the summer, there was a lot of debate on if there was a QB battle between him and freshman Cade Klubnik, who was last year's top quarterback in the country. Mm -hmm. A kid out of Texas, went to the powerhouse high school, Westlake, put up huge numbers, blew up on the circuit, went all the way up to number one and decided to go to Clemson. He's a skinny guy. He's like 190 pounds, Mm -hmm. but he can sling it and he's accurate and he's... He's just a really smart quarterback that can make all the throws. Dabo Swinney has said DJ is the guy coming into this season. We'll have to see how much he's actually adjusted. Right. (laughs) How mobile he actually is losing that weight. And how this offense can rebound. Because they bring back a lot of the same receivers. Mm -hmm. They lose Justin Ross. They lose Aju Aju to South Florida in the transfer portal. But they still bring back some talented guys, some big body guys. They have some younger guys that they brought in that are slot-type receivers that can do more, but they're unproven, so we'll have to see what they do. Right. I think this could be a breakout year for Will Shipley at at, at the running back position. And they also have Kobe Pace, who's a, the veteran guy. I believe Clemson should make a really big comeback this season. Mm-hmm. They start out with Georgia Tech, who we'll get to them later at the bottom of the conference. <laughs> Play Furman, 2-0. and Louisiana Tech, 3-0. and Wake Forest, we'll get to them, 4-0. and NC State at home, NC State is going to be tough, but I think that's 5-0. and On the road at Boston College could be tough. On the road at Florida State could be tough. They beat Syracuse, could lose at Notre Dame, should beat Louisville, could beat Miami. 
I think they're at least a nine win team. I expect them to win at least ten. Okay. Because that that second half of the schedule, you have two to three games that could be up in the air. Right. But they're the more talented and more well coached team in most situations. Mm -hmm. So they could get tripped up at Boston College. Maybe that's the game after NC State, and that the next week after that they have Florida State. So we're in a between spot at Notre Dame. Who knows how good they'll be at that point. And Miami and South Carolina at the end, we'll see how good they are. Right. I expect Clemson to be at the top of the conference once again. Okay. And I expect them to get to 10 wins. So, yeah, Clemson, maybe not as dominant as they used to be, but back to 10. Okay. So, I'm going to keep it in the, at, in, on, in the Atlantic division at this time. Next up, NC State. They're coached by Dave Doran, who – Honestly, is one of the more underrated coaches in the country. He's consistently had NC State between like seven and nine wins his entire time there. But the fan base has wanted them to get over the hump at least once. Mm -hmm. They've had quarterbacks like Russell Wilson, who left to go to Wisconsin. They had Mike Glennon, your 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 guy, the long neck quarterback. <laughs> they couldn't re get over the hump with him, even though they had some good upset wins. Right. They've never been able to reach that level. This is the year that they should be able to maybe do it. And the biggest reason is their returning quarterback, Devin Leary. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that didn't get the appreciation he deserved last year. Yeah. He was never on any top quarterback lists. He just went completely under the radar. Mm -hmm. And this is with him throwing over 3,000 yards, 35 touchdowns, and only five interceptions last season. That is a stat line that most college quarterbacks never hit. Yeah. And that is extremely impressive. And his completion percentage was over 65%. So he was mostly clean for most of the season. Right. But there were only a few games where they couldn't get over the hump. And he it, it just – he never got a shine. And I believe this is the season where it will finally happen. Mm -hmm. Now, they do lose some key running backs, Ricky Person and Bam Knight, both guys that left and are in uh, NFL training camps. They also lost a few veteran receivers, but they have a lot of young talent in the receiving core that I believe could step up. They have been reloading on the defensive line and in the front seven for years and years, mm -hmm. and I believe they'll just do that again. They lose a few guys to the draft, and they always reload, so I believe the defense will be well coached. You look at the schedule, I believe they could open up 4-0. At East Carolina, I think that's a win. Charleston Southern win at home against Texas Tech. Could be tough, but I think that's a win. And UConn win. Now, the game at Clemson, it's a 50-50. <laughs> could be a win, could be a loss. Right. At home against Florida State, I say that's a win. Mm -hmm. Win at Syracuse. Virginia Tech game could be tough. I think that could be a win. Wake Forest game could be a bit of a toss-up. Boston College, Louisville, and North Carolina, those are really a tough three-game slate at the end. Yeah. Because I believe in Devin Leary and Dave Doran so much, and I believe in their defense and their ability to rebound, I'm going to give them 10 wins. Okay. I'm going to say they lose at Clemson, and I'm going to say they lose at Louisville. And I think they win the rest of their games. Now, I don't know what the tiebreakers will be. I don't know how it sets up between them and Clemson. Right. This could be the year NC State finally makes it to the conference championship. Mm -hmm. But like I said, that that game is a real toss-up. So we will see what happens. But I believe in NC State. I believe in the Wolfpack this season. Hmm. And Devin Leary should finally get the credit he deserves, even if he doesn't have the same stat line as last year. Yeah. So moving on after NC State, I'm going to go to Wake Forest because there was breaking news yesterday. That completely changed my thoughts on Wake Forest. Sam Hartman, their quarterback of the last two years, put up big numbers last year, over 35 touchdowns, a, a few too many interceptions, I think 13 or 14, mm -hmm. but over 4,000 yards passing. Yesterday it was announced that he has a non-football-related injury that will have him out indefinitely. Hmm. And I would have had, even though – I don't think they would have been as great as last year 
I still think I would have had them around eight wins. Mm-hmm. It's going to be much tougher without Sam Hartman. I mean, they've they've got, in my opinion, probably the most underrated coach in college football at the moment. And Dave Clawson is his name. A guy that's – his name has come up for a lot of big jobs over the past few years. Mm-hmm. But he stayed at Wake Forest and made that a consistent good program. They got receiver A.T. Perry – who's 6'5", over 200 pounds, had a monster season last season, 15 receiving touchdowns. He's going to get a lot of NFL buzz. They got Donovan Green coming back off of an ACL injury. Their receivers are going to be good. Their running back core is going to be good. They have some things to replace on defense. But not having Sam Hartman hurts a lot. Right. And I think they have a good backup option in Michael Kern, who's a redshirt sophomore, a guy that has got a little bit of time over the past few years but hasn't played a ton. He has some skill, but I don't know if he can live up to what Sam Hartman is as a leader and the the leader of the program, the face of the program. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a tough year for Wake Forest with not with him not coming back. They still could possibly get seven wins, but they got to play Liberty. Without Sam Hartman, I think Liberty could really give them a test. I don't think they be, beat Clemson without him. I think they could lose at Florida State without him. Mm-hmm. Boston College will be tough. Louisville will be tough. They could go 6-6. Six and six. I still think they figure out a way to make a bowl game because of Dave Clawson mm-hmm. and the way their system is, but I I just don't see them getting over the hump without Sam Hartman. And it's really unfortunate that he has to be out for the the season, I assume, because it, it still isn't out what his illness or injury is, but yeah, yeah unfortunate for Wake Forest. Hmm. Next, I'm going to go to Florida State because – they're up in the air after last season. Five and seven should have been six and six, but lost to Jacksonville State at home on an insane, weird Hail Mary play at the end. <laughs> Mike Norvell has to figure this out this year, or he might be out. They've got Jordan Travis coming back as a quarterback, starting again. Last year, it went back and forth between him and uh, I, f- I forgot the quarterback's name. It slipped my mind. But it went back and forth. Once he started in the second half of the season, he started to gain some momentum, but he's never showed the full consistency of a season. He has great running ability. He's been a decent thrower. He needs to improve to a quality thrower for them to get over the hump. They brought in so many transfers to try and fix what they missed last season (laughs) or what they're losing. Jermaine Johnson was Defensive Player of the Year in the ACC. He got drafted by the Jets. They brought in a guy named Jared Verse from Albany. FCS, who has a lot of hype. They brought in a bunch of uh, transfer receivers from Oregon and Arizona State, guys that aren't extremely proven from their other schools but have a bunch of talent. I I just I don't, I don't know with Florida State. They have to make a bowl game this year, mm-hmm. and their schedule doesn't set up for them to just have an easy road. They got Duquesne week one. But they go to LSU week two. Yeah. And even though it's Brian Kelly with a brand new team in LSU, I have no idea what to expect out of that. Yeah. They could lose at Louisville. I think they beat Boston College at home. I think they beat Wake Forest at home. Mm -hmm. I think they lose at NC State. Could lose to Clemson. Should beat Georgia Tech. Could lose to Miami. Should beat Syracuse. It's back and forth all season with me on Florida State. Right. They have to at least get six and six. Mm -hmm. You have to make a bowl game if you're Florida State. If you're Mike Norvell, the transfers have to hit. Jordan Travis has to hit the next level. Right. I hope they hit six and six. It would be really good to see Florida State at least back in a bowl game again. Mm-hmm. But with the schedule, it's it's hard to predict. Right. Maybe six and six is what I say. And that's really tough for Florida State, but it is what it is. Next is Louisville, the Louisville Cardinals who are having a out-of-nowhere recruiting resurgence all of a sudden, getting a bunch of top players in the next year's class. But right now we're talking about this season. They return quarterback Malik Cunningham, who honestly had a ridiculous season in terms of stats last year. Mm -hmm. He rushed for over 1,000 yards and 20 rushing touchdowns, and he threw 20 touchdowns. Yeah. So he was just – And almost 3,000 yards. Yeah, he, he was a problem. But the defense was bad, and the rest of the offense couldn't pick up most of the slack. 
it was just inconsistent all around besides Malik Cunningham. Mm -hmm. So he had to keep them afloat for the most part. This year, I expect them to make a small leap, nothing too big, but they could hit eight wins. I think most likely seven, but they bring in some nice transfers to replace some guys they lost. They bring in running back Tyon Evans from Tennessee, who was pretty good for them before they decided to play other guys, and he just decided decided to leave. But they bring in receivers D. Wiggins and Tyler Hudson from Miami and Central Arkansas. I think they're both good. Muhammad Sanogo, linebacker from Ole Miss. They bring in some good talent, and I and they return some good talent. I like what Louisville has. I like Malik Cunningham. I think he can be a bit of a breakout player, a guy that gets a lot of attention going into draft season next year. Mm-hmm. Their schedule isn't the hardest. Syracuse week one, I think they win. UCF week two is a toss-up. I think they could beat Florida State at home. I think they beat South Florida at home. They could be, They could win at Boston College. Could win at Virginia. Pittsburgh is a toss-up. Wake Forest win. James Madison win. That's already like five and two. Then you got Clemson, NC State, and Kentucky at the end. If you get two of those... You get seven, three of them eight. I think they could beat Kentucky or NC State. They could also go one and two in that stretch. Mm -hmm. So it could end up being six and six with a rush stretch at the end. But I think most likely seven and five, possibly eight and four, because I believe in in, uh, Malik uh, Cunningham that much. He's just a force running and throwing the ball. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be a problem for a lot of teams. So I expect Louisville to have a good season. And lastly in that division, Syracuse. This is sad because they have (laughs) arguably, arguably the best running back in the country. And nobody knows. Sean Tucker, running back for Syracuse, had an incredible season last year. 1,500 yards running, 12 yards, I mean 12 touchdowns on the ground, 6 yards per carry. He's a bell cow. He's only like 5'11", like 205, 210. Yeah. But you give him the ball almost like every other or every two plays, he's going to hit a big run or he's going to get you almost 10 yards. He's just, he's a machine. Yeah. He's elusive. He's, t- he's tough. And he can catch out of the backfield. But they're just not talented enough. He ran more than his quarterback threw. Yes. That's been their big problem ever since Eric Dungy left like four years ago. Mm-hmm. They've ne- they haven't been able to find the right quarterback. They had Tommy DeVito, who didn't fit the system, transferred to Illinois this year. They they bring in Garrett Schrader from Mississippi State last year, who's a better runner than thrower. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows how, if he's really improved that much since last season. But the uh, the passing stats didn't show up last year. He did really well running. Yeah. But if if they can't throw the ball consistently, it just won't work. Right. And Dino Babers is going to be on the hot seat very soon. If they don't win more than three games, there's a good chance he could possibly be out. I think he might get another year. When you got Sean Tucker, Mm -hmm. you got a chance in most games. But like I said, Garrett Schrader isn't very consistent. Their receiving core is nothing to be afraid of. And their defense, even though they have a few gems on their defense – but it it just won't be enough. It won't be enough at the end of the day. Yeah. And their their schedule is just it's so tough. You start off with Louisville. UConn might be tough because they have Jim Moore as their coach now, who coached UCLA in their best years in the twenty tens. They got Purdue, they got Virginia. It's it's just I don't expect more than four wins. Yeah. If they hit four, it's a success, but they want more. So I think I still think they end up the, land at the end of the division. Gotcha. Now going at, to the other side of the ACC to the Coastal, you have a few teams with some hype, a few teams that could disappoint. Yeah. It's a kind of a crapshoot, but this is how it is. The Miami Hurricanes, everybody wants the U to be back. They had their time with Mark Rick that one magical season, but it fell apart in the end. Manny Diaz couldn't figure it out while he was there. And now you have another hometown guy after Manny Diaz. 
but with a higher coaching pedigree. Mario Cristobal comes in from Oregon, big time recruiter, learned under Nick Saban at Alabama, had quality years at Oregon, but with the talent he was able to to accumulate, he never hit the heights that the fans expected. Mm -hmm. Now he comes to Miami and his ultimatum when he comes to Miami is I need the money. I need all the buy-in possible <laughs> to get this program back to where you want it. And uh, Manny Diaz asked for this, and they didn't give him what they're giving Mario Cristobal. Right. He's getting all the money and all the revenue he needs. And now that the NIL era is starting, mm-hmm. his next recruiting class coming in is the best Miami has had in years. Yeah. But with the team he has right now, he has a lot of pieces to work with. In terms of coaching, he has a brand new offensive coordinator who was on my team the past few years, Josh Gaddis, a guy that felt slighted at Michigan, left, and decided to go to Miami with Mario Cristobal. They return a quarterback that came out of nowhere last season. Hmm. They started the season with De'Eric King, a guy who was good in his own right, really good runner, quality passer, but it was just bad from the jump. They played Alabama in the Chick-fil-A Classic and got destroyed. They lose to Michigan State at home and can never build any momentum. And then De'Ara King got hurt. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what to expect once he got hurt. And in came Tyler Van Dyke, a retro freshman out of Connecticut that stepped in and immediately just started balling. Mm -hmm. He only started seven games, I believe. And by the end of the season... He had almost 3,000 yards, 25 touchdowns, and six picks. (laughs) Yeah. Just just seven games, and it was clear that he was the – he's been the guy Miami's been looking for at quarterback for years, and he couldn't even start the season. It was all on De'Ara King's shoulders. He got hurt, and then this guy just rises. Mm -hmm. And he's the classic build, a classic pocket pocket passer that you want. 6'4", 210, 215. And he can make all the throws. He is more athletic than you'd think. He's mobile. He's not a scrambler. But he can get out and move. But he's, he does most of his damage in the pocket. Yeah. And he can make all the throws. And he's really accurate. So the hype on him is going to be huge. They return several young, talented running backs. Their receiver room has been somewhat of a question mark and something they're still trying to figure out within camp. But they have a few guys that they like. They brought in a transfer from Clemson, uh, Frank Ladson, a big body guy. But they're most of them are unproven, mm-hmm. so they're trying to figure that out. And they have two quality tight end options that I really like. One of them is a young guy, Elijah Arroyo. He's more of a pass catcher than a blocker. And the other guy, Will Mallory, is more of a black blo- blocker than a pass catcher, but he can do both. Hmm. So having Josh Gaddis, he's going to use tight ends a lot with the talent they have and with the receiving core being a bunch of unknowns. And they're going to rely on Tyler Van Dyke a ton mm-hmm. on the offensive side. On the defensive side, they also brought in a bunch of transfers that they're gonna, that they're relying on. News out of camp so far is that transfer Darrell Jackson, who's a defensive tackle, has just been unstoppable in camp. So most likely he's going to be a starter. They're going to rely on him a ton. They have safety James Williams coming back who isn't the size of a, of a typical safety. He's 6'5", 215. Jesus. <laughs> Extremely huge, big body guy. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing is, he's not known for being like a super hard hitter. Yeah. He's almost known more for being like an athlete than a like a super hard hitting safety. But that athletic build at safety is just ridiculous. Mm. So they people expect him to take a big step and become an all-American type guy with his athletic pedigree and his size and speed at that size. Gotcha. So... The hype on the U is back. (laughs) Mario Cristobal is here. And when you look at the schedule, it's an easy 4-0 to start. Bethune-Cookman, Southern Miss. Actually, I don't know how I skipped over this week three. They go to Texas A&M week three. (laughs) And this is a team that has high expectations this season. I don't expect them to beat Texas A&M, so actually I think it'll be 3-1. After Texas A&M, they play MTSU at home. That's a win. They get North Carolina at home. North Carolina has a QB battle. They haven't figured a lot of, a lot of things out. Mm-hmm. I think they beat North Carolina. I think they beat Virginia Tech at Virginia Tech. And I think they beat Duke. 
So that's a one, two, three, four, five and one start. Actually, six and one. Yeah. Then they go to Virginia. These are the type of games in the past that Miami usually slips up on. They could lose at Virginia, so I'll call that a toss-up. The Florida State game won't be easy. Right. I think they should win it, so I, I, I'll give it to them, but it could be a toss-up. I expect them to win at Georgia Tech. I think they lose at Clemson. And the Pittsburgh game, I'll give that one to them. <laughs> I just, I'm just being, I'm being nice today. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's around a 9-3 and three season for Miami year one. Right. Could be eight and four because, like I said, the Florida State game could be a toss up. They could lose at Virginia, and the Pittsburgh game also could be difficult. But it's at home, and Pittsburgh is kind of in flux right now. Mm-hmm. So this could be a really positive first year for Mario Cristobal. You have the quarterback, you have enough talent on offense, although it's not very unproven, and you have talent on defense, and that's Mario Cristobal's key thing. That's his specialty. So with the schedule being what it is, I I think they could hit nine. I expect at least eight. Eight or nine would be a huge success in his first season. Right. So good things for Miami year one. The U isn't officially back yet, but a great step. <laughs> Next up, I'm going to go to the team that won the ACC last year, Pitt. Last year, they had a weird start. They lost to Western Michigan. <laughs> In week two at home. Yeah. They gave up like 53 points. Now, this was Caleb Ellaby, who was a high-level Mac quarterback, one of the best quarterbacks in the group of five. Right. And a NFL-level receiver in Sky, Sky Moore, who's now with the Chiefs. Yep. But you lost to Western Michigan at home week two. <laughs> There's no excuse. There were a lot of questions after that loss. The fans were kind of out after that game. They were saying Pat Narduzzi should be fired. And then something happened. Kenny Pickett, the guy that I, the guy that I was completely against in my previews last year, mm-hmm. he became a different guy. And he hit a run that was just unbelievable. Right. Him and Jordan Addison, from that point on, were just unstoppable. They beat Clemson. They went to Virginia Tech and beat them. They just started taking everybody down. Right. And the pass game was what le- was leading them. And Kenny Pickett was just clean, hitting big passes. Jordan Addison won the Bolitnikoff. They win 10 games, and they win the ACC beating Wake Forest. Mm-hmm. Huge year for Pitt. Things have changed, though. The offensive coordinator they had, Mark Whipple, he's gone. He went to Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And it is very crazy because him and Pat Narduzzi didn't get along because of philosophies. And at ACC Media Days, Pat Narduzzi was complaining about the ACC championship that they won saying we didn't run the ball enough. Right. So that tells you enough about Pat Narduzzi and his philosophy. Yeah. Kitty Pickett is gone to the draft to Pittsburgh with the Steelers. And Jordan Addison, who said he was going to stay, transferred to USC to play receiver there. That's a lot of change. Right. Now, to replace Kenny Pickett, they go into the transfer portal. And they bring in a guy who had several ups and downs at USC. Jordan, I mean, Jordan Addison goes to USC. Keaton Slovis comes to Pitt. Mm-hmm. Keaton Slovis came in as a decently recruited quarterback at USC who just lit up in his freshman year after JT Daniels got hurt. Right. Out of nowhere became the chosen one. Mm-hmm. His sophomore year, he has a dip. Things fall apart a little. He's just kind of average. They get embarrassed by Oregon in the Pac-12 championship in the COVID season. And he gets hurt going into the next year. Yeah. He has some redemption now. Nobody knows how much he can re- rebound. Could he go back to that freshman season? Could it be a bit of the inconsistency from that COVID season? Mm-hmm. People don't know, but there are high hopes that he can be that guy again at Pitt. Right. And Pat Narduzzi seems to trust him, even though they stay, they still say it's a battle in the camp. Most people expect Keaton Slovis to win the job. Right. And like I said, with the philosophy things between him and Mark Whipple, Pat Narduzzi is looking to the the offense to be more of a balance now. Yeah. He doesn't want to air it out 40 to 50 times a game. He wants it to be more of like 25 to 30, 30 to 35 maybe, with the running game being more balanced. Yeah. 
Now, when you look at their run game, they actually do have talent. They have a guy, one of the best names in college football, in my opinion, Israel Abenikanda, kid out of New York. He's like 6'1", like 205, Mm -hmm. has a lot of speed, hasn't put it all together yet. But last season, he rushed for 651 yards, seven touchdowns, almost five yards of carry. Right. You give him more carries, you assume all those numbers go up Mm -hmm. because the kid has a lot of talent. They also bring back Vincent Davis, a smaller back, that runs with a lot of power, actually, for his size. He's like 5'8", like 195. Really well-rounded back. That could be a really nice two-headed monster. With Jordan Addison gone, they have to replace a lot of receiving production. Yeah. A lot. Right. Now, they bring in a kid from Akron, of all places, <laughs> who was surprisingly one of the best young receivers in the country last season. Kanata Mumpfield. He had over 50 catches, almost 900 yards receiving, and like eight touchdowns as a true freshman. He went to Ohio State and had a big game there. So he was just a gem that Akron happened to find, and now he's at Pitt. Mm -hmm. They expect him to step in and be one of their number one and number two. They bring back Jared Wayne from last year, who was a very solid number two receiver. And they have a few other experienced guys who they expect to step up in Jordan Addison's uh, uh, disappearance. (laughs) And they always reload on defense. They always have defensive linemen, and they return a ton of guys on defense. So I'm not afraid on that side. Yeah. When you look at Pitt's schedule, it's not an easy start. West Virginia week one at home, renewing that rivalry. I actually think they they should win that game, even though JT Daniels is coming in. Mm -hmm. West Virginia has things to figure out. I think Pitt wins that one. Last year they played at Tennessee and won by one point. Yeah, Tennessee's coming to Pittsburgh this time. They won't be playing around. Hendon Hooker is going to be airing it out. They're going to have that fast-paced offense. And Pat Narduzzi is going to want to play slow. Toss-up, I'm going to say Tennessee Mm -hmm. because they're just so deadly on offense. They put up 41 on Pittsburgh last year in their second game of the season. Right. Then you go to Western Michigan week three. Yeah. Now, with Caleb Ellaby gone, I'm going to say Pitt wins this one. They should, but yeah. Western Michigan is a team to know sneaky. that they just air it out. Yes, and they, they're, they're one of those sneaky, high-level MAC teams yeah. that can pull off an upset. But I'm going to give it to Pitt yeah, because I don't I don't think you can just replace Caleb Ellaby like that at Western. Right. Next, you got Rhode Island win. That's 3-1. and one. Georgia Tech week four, I mean week five, win. That's 4-1. and one. Virginia Tech, I think that could be a toss-up. I think they lose at Louisville. They could lose at North Carolina. I think they beat Syracuse. I think they lose at Virginia. I think they beat Duke. And that last game of the season is a toss-up. Mm-hmm. So seven to eight wins for Pittsburgh is a quality season. Not what they did last season, but last season doesn't happen very often at Pitt. <laughs> right. Going from 10 to eight wins is nothing to be disappointed in. Mm-hmm. I think it's a better chance they're seven, but they could hit eight. If Keaton Slovis returns to what he was, the run game is good and the defense keeps doing what they do. So it should be a good season for Pitt. Next up is North Carolina. This is Mac Brown's fourth season back at North Carolina after being there in the 90s. They lose the guy that got them back on track after their horrible season in 2017, I believe, yeah. when they only won like two games. Right. Sam Hell came in as a true freshman blue chip guy and instantly got them to six wins when everything was up in the air. Yeah. They never hit the level that people expected. There was a lot of hype last year. But the talent they thought would, would take over was too young and they weren't ready. Yeah. Sam Hell had to do everything on his own almost. Yeah. It was him, him, Ty Chandler. And again, we, we go back to the previous season because my fiance loves North Carolina. Um, so I watched closely. Yeah. Um, yeah, people got all hyped last year, even though they lost Javante Williams and Michael Carter. Yeah. We didn't really expect them to be exactly that same team, but yeah, they definitely struggled at times. Yeah. And it was Sam Howell, Ty Chandler and Josh Downs, who's one of the best receivers in the country, had big numbers last season. Mm-hmm. You lose Sam Howell now and you actually aren't in a horrible position when it comes to your options at quarterback. You have Drake May, who was a blue-chip guy after Sam Howell. 
freshman last year, was a top five quarterback in the country. Actually, the brother of Luke May. Oh, I was, was going to ask. Yeah. The, was the, like, the, May, the May family, May. They, their whole family is just legacy North Carolina. Hmm. Their dad played there. Luke played basketball. Now Drake is the quarterback. And his younger brother is a freshman walk-on <laughs> football player in North Carolina now, too. Nice. So it's a, just a family thing. But Drake May, highly touted, big 6'5", 210 pounds, makes all the throws, and he's athletic. He's battling with a sophomore in Jacoby Criswell. A guy that's shorter, only like six foot six one. Yeah. But he's like two twenty, two twenty five. They have him listed at two thirty two. Yeah. Well, with that two thirty two, he can move. Yeah. He can scramble and he can make plays with his legs. But he has he also has a big arm. He has an underrated arm, honestly. He he started in the game last year. Sam Howell didn't play against Wofford. Mm-hmm. And he had an impressive first half. And Drake may play the second half. So it's still a battle going on in that camp. I honestly think they can win games with either quarterback. I like Drake May a lot. I like what Jacoby Criswell can do. I think they'll both play throughout the season, honestly. Okay. Now, they're again um, playing with a new running back core this year. Mm -hmm. They're not going to mostly go with, like, one main guy like last year with Ty Chandler. They're going to rely on several guys that are both experienced and young. The receiving core is where it starts to get dicey. Because outside of Josh Downs, you have little experience. And one of their main receivers, Antoine Green, got hurt in the last few days. I think they said he's out six to eight weeks. So besides Josh Downs, you have a lot of youth and inexperience. Now, it's a, there are several highly recruited guys, but you don't know what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. So, and on the defensive side, it's similar. Where last year, I expected North Carolina to hit high levels because they recruited so great on the defensive side. On defensive end, defensive tackle, linebacker, corner, they got five-star, high four-star guys on defense. But none of them hit yet. This is the year all of them are supposed to start hitting. Sophomores and juniors and a few freshmen. You got size, you got speed at all levels. Some of those guys are supposed to start hitting this year. And one of them in particular, I believe, Desmond Evans. He's six six. He's over two hundred and fifty pounds. He's a freak athlete. Mm. But he has to figure it out and hit that athletic ceiling that he has. I should, he should hit get like close to nine, ten sacks because of his talent. And they also have two really good corners in Tony Grimes and um let me look real quick. He he has one of the better names in college football. What's his name? Uh, where is it? Where is it? With Duck. His first name is Duck. Duck. Duck Storm Duck is his name. Storm Duck. Storm Duck. Duck that's his name. Top five name. Top three wow. name in college football. Corner Storm Duck, who's led them in picks like the past two seasons. So, I don't expect them to hit eight wins. Okay. Which would be kind of alarming to some North Carolina fans. But we have to adjust expectations to what North Carolina football has been throughout their history. Right. The recruiting has never been super high. You're just starting to get this high-level talent, and they're all figuring it out. It's a bunch of young dudes, and the schedule isn't easy. You got Florida A&M week one, which is a win. But then you go to Appalachian State. Mm -hmm. An in-state group of five team who's been at the top of their conference for the past four, three, four years. That game won't be easy. I think they win it, but it could be a Mm toss-up. Appalachian State is tough. I think they win at Georgia State. I think they could lose to Notre Dame at home week four. Virginia Tech won't be easy. I think they lose at Miami. I think they beat Duke, but the Pittsburgh game could be a toss-up. Pittsburgh could win that one. Could lose at Virginia, but I'll give them that one. Went out Wake Forest, beat Georgia Tech, and I think they lose to NC State. That's around seven and five, eight and four at best, but I think seven and five. Hmm. And honestly, because what I said with the Pitt before, I think I gave Pitt that win. I think I did. Honestly, can't remember. It was only a few minutes ago. Yeah, no. They're both going to be around the same area. I would give Pitt the slight edge. Probably them eight, North Carolina seven. Mm-hmm. They'll both be decent enough teams, but not at the top of the conference, in my opinion. 
Now to the bottom ones. I'm going to go Virginia and Virginia Tech. Both teams that are in transition. So Virginia, they have a new coach in Tony Elliott. Mm-hmm. Offensive coordinator for Clemson for the past five, six years. He's had high praise for years. This is a bit of, it's not really a rebuild. It's a retool, but it won't be easy. The one thing he has on his side is his returning quarterback, Brennan Armstrong. He had a big season last year. Mm -hmm. For almost 4,500 passing yards. And he had 31 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. The whole offense was predicated on him. Right. They had almost no running game. Mm -hmm. And for him to put up those numbers with it all being on his shoulders for the most part is extremely impressive. He decided to come back for a senior year and skip on the NFL for one more season because mm. he, he's just a Virginia guy. He loves the program and he wants it to be in a good position with the new head coach. Right. They also bring back a lot of receiving talent, almost all of their production. Dontavian Wicks, who honestly is one of my most underrated receivers coming into this season. I think he's a high-level NFL guy. Dontavian Wicks, Keaton Thompson, Billy Kemp. They have a strong receiving core. But they have to completely restructure the run game, which Tony Elliott said he's trying to do. He wants it to be more balanced than it was last year mm -hmm. when it was mostly passing. They bring in transfer to, uh, Cody Brown from Miami, who didn't play a lot in Miami, but was highly recruited as a freshman. He's coming into Virginia as a redshirt freshman. And their biggest problem is the defense. They bring in a defensive coordinator from Air Force who has a big task because they don't have a lot of talent. All levels have lost players. They've lost guys to the NFL. And I, it won't be easy. They're going to have to outscore a lot of teams. Hmm. And luckily, their schedule isn't very hard. <laughs> Richmond week one, mm -hmm. win. Playing at Illinois, I think that could be a win. Old Dominion Week 3 won't be the easiest, but I think that's a win. They play at Syracuse Week 4, I think that's a win. They play at Duke Week 5, I think that's a win. If you're 5-0 and to start in year one, that's fantastic. Right. I think it's most likely 4-1. and I think they lose to at least one, whether it's Illinois or Syracuse. I think they start 4-1 and most likely. The rest of the schedule, pretty tough. But if you could beat Georgia Tech or you could beat Coastal Carolina or Virginia Tech in the last few weeks, I think Virginia's 6-6. Six and six. Hmm. Year one, Tony Elliott, I think Virginia hit 6-6 six and six because of their schedule. And that's really good for them in year one. Right. Yeah, not much else to say about them. It's going to be a lot of offense, not much defense. But the schedule gives them a lot of time to, to to figure things out. So I think Virginia goes six and six. Brennan Armstrong will be in NFL draft talks by the end of the season. Hmm. Virginia Tech. Horrible, horrible drop under Justin Fuente. The level that the receipt that the recruiting dropped off was very, very crazy. Mm -hmm. They were starting to miss on every top Virginia recruit. They couldn't hit on anybody in the surrounding areas the Carolinas, anything. The The talent level has dropped so low that they've had to start moving different players around the roster to different positions. <laughs> they've brought in a bunch of transfers. By the way, the new head coach is Brent Pry, <laughs> who was the defensive coordinator at Penn State the past few seasons. He got high praise. He did a really good job at Penn State. Now he's back home to Virginia to try and figure things out there. They bring in two transfers at quarterback. Because last season, it just wasn't good enough. Yeah. They bring in Grant Wells from Marshall and Jason Brown from from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Grant Wells was a quality group of five quarterback. Not sure how good he'll be in the ACC. He should be good enough. Jason Brown, fifth-year senior, great leader, has some talent. Won a few games in the SEC, so he has some th some stuff. Yeah. They're still battling out in camp. Some, th some people think Grant Wells – because he's younger and an even better thrower, but who knows? This is really uh, this is going to be a tough rebuild for Brent Pry, because of the way the talent has been left by Justin Fuente. They lose some key receivers in the transfer portal. They lose some running backs in the transfer portal. 
Luckily, they have some guys returning on defense, but I don't know if they'll make a bowl game. It'll be if they hit six, it'll be a great first season. They could lose against Old Dominion Week One. I'm not even. I'm not even kidding. It's possible they lose to Old Dominion. They could lose to Boston College at home Week Two. They could lose to West West Virginia Week Four. I don't know what to expect out of this team. Yeah, hitting six is the goal. They could be four and eight. Honestly, I'm going to put it in between there. Four and eight, six and six. It depends on what they get out of Grant Wells or Jason Brown. It's a good chance they play both throughout the season. Good luck, Virginia Tech fans. You have a you have a ways to go. Just make it through the season. It's going to take a lot to get the talent back in in Virginia Tech. Last two, Duke and Georgia Tech. Duke. They hire a new head coach in Mike Elko, who's been the defensive coordinator at Texas A and M the past few seasons. Taking over a job like this shows he likes to take risks. Mm -hmm. He likes to challenge himself because Duke is one of the biggest challenges in the country. Yeah. It is a job that not many coaches have been able to succeed at, and only a few have. They had a few extreme bright spots in the early 2010s. They made the ACC championship game in 2013. Yeah. Lost in the Chick-fil-A Bowl to Johnny Manziel in Texas A&M, 110 games. They made three or four bowl games in the 2010s. A really great stretch. Mm -hmm. It's time to rebuild again. Now, the biggest thing with Duke right now, they have a quarterback battle in camp. And I honestly think it is one of the more interesting quarterback battles in the conference and in the country. Hmm. They have two young guys that nobody truly knows because they barely played and they weren't the highest recruited guys. But they both are gems. One of them is Riley Leonard, a guy out of Alabama who's a redshirt freshman. He's 6'4", like 215. He has all the throwing talent in the world. You watch this kid, and he looks like a high four star when he's throwing it. But he was all, he was also a basketball kid. Nobody knew if he was going to pick basketball or football. He chose football mm-hmm. and went to Duke. He could be like a Daniel Jones type, who was extremely under un, under recruited, and just blows up over three years because he has all the throwing talent you need. Mm-hmm. But he just he's gone under the radar, always. And then you have Jordan Moore, who's a scrambler. He is electric with the ball in his hands. When he decides to tuck it and run, he's going to make people miss and make people look silly. He's great with the ball in his hands running. He's only an average passer. He has a lot of arm talent. He has a strong arm, but he's not the most accurate. Mm -hmm. But these two guys, I think whichever you choose, you could win at least three games in this first year at Duke. But you got to choose one. Riley Leonard is more more of the pocket guy. Jordan Moore is more of the scrambler. I like both options. I'll be one of the few people that's not a Duke fan that'll be watching Duke football this year. The schedule isn't easy. I think they beat Temple week one. Northwestern, a lot of people expect Northwestern to be a dumpster fire again. So they have a chance to get against Northwestern, but I think that's more of a toss-up. Yeah. I think they beat North Carolina A&T week three. I don't think they beat Kansas week four because, like I said last week, I think Kansas is is in the right direction, and I think they're talented enough to beat Duke. I think they could beat Georgia Tech at Georgia Tech. That could get them three wins. I don't see them winning anything else. It's a steep rebuild for Mike Elko. Hmm. They're not talented enough on defense, even though he's a defensive coach. Two interesting quarterbacks. We'll see what happens. I think they could hit three wins, but it could be two. Now, Georgia Tech, listen. I, this is, this, this just isn't, I feel bad for Georgia Tech fans. They had a lot of good years running the option under Paul Johnson. They had a lot of really, really good years. Mm. A few years, they beat Georgia two out of three years between, I I think 2014 and 16, they beat Georgia twice. They made the orange bowl one year where they had that one breakout year. Darren Waller was one of their receivers. They've had some years, but, uh, it's, it's It hasn't been good lately. <laughs> it just hasn't. Head coach Jeff Collins, he's had to do a rebuild out of the option into a spread offense, and it hasn't been pretty. His first year, he brings in actually a highly recruited re- quarterback in Jeff Sims in his first year two years ago. Jeff Sims just hasn't been able to put it together. He has a bunch of raw talent. He can run. He can throw. 
But there's this it's something like in Nebraska with Scott Frost putting everything on Adrian Martinez. Mm-hmm. This is what Jeff Collins did with Jeff Sims. And it hasn't paid off in three years. Last year they lost to Northern Illinois at home. And that basically crushed the season after that one. Now they brought in another option at quarterback and Zach Gibson from Akron, who was Kanata Mumpfield's uh quarterback, the good the kid that transferred to Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And he's more accurate than Jeff Sims. But Jeff Collins he's he's stuck to Jeff. All in. He said he Jeff is his guy. And unless it just completely falls apart, he's thinking with Jeff Sims. Now, the biggest reason why I think it's almost over for him, Jameer Gibbs, running back, he brought his first two big recruits were Jeff Sims, Jeff Sims and Jameer Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs was a five-star running back who chose to start as a freshman and, and go with the rebuild at Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. He's been one of the better running backs in the country the past two years. But nobody's really known because he's played for Georgia Tech. Yeah. Now he's at Alabama. And everybody expects him to be almost a Heisman contender. Mm. <laughs> he's going to be the starter for Alabama, and he's a stud. Well, just looking at their averages, like he averaged 5.2 yards a carry last year on 143 Listen, attempts. Jameer their, Gibbs was a monster. Their running game almost averaged five yards a carry across the board. Yeah. So. He's gone. <laughs> he's gone. They have some experienced guys that aren't. Like the the real big play guys, they're just decent running backs. They brought in a freshman Antonio Martin, who's pretty good, but can't live up to the talent of Jameer Gibbs. Losing him is just a crusher. It's a real crusher. They do have some talent in the receiving core. Leo Blackburn is a guy who has major talent. He's like six five, like two oh five, and he's a receiver. He has some. He's a bit of a freak athlete. But you start the year with Clemson. I mean, what what do you do? Right. You got Ole Miss week three, you UCF week four. Mm-hmm. You beat West Carolina week two, but that's that's a one and three start. Lose to Pittsburgh. I said I think they could lose to Duke. I think they lose to Virginia. I I don't know how they hit more than three wins. Yeah, I just don't know. I'm sorry, Jeff Collins. It just never came together. Mm-hmm. Transitioning from the option to the spread. It it just didn't happen. Yeah. And Matt, like I said, Matt, a part of it could be he didn't hit on that special quarterback. Right. Like when Mac when Mac Brown came to North Carolina, hitting on Sam Howell is the reason why he's still there. Because mm-hmm. Sam Howell was the generational, I'm getting this team wins quarterback. Scott Frost didn't have that. Jeff Collins didn't get it in Jeff Sims. Yeah. And they've never been able to transition, even with having Jameer Gibbs, who's now gone to Alabama. Hmm. to become a real superstar. So Georgia Tech at the bottom with Duke, but I think Duke could possibly get one over on them. Yeah. And that's the ACC. Clemson and NC State on one side, whoever gets the tiebreaker there. And on the other side, I think most likely Miami. North Carolina could maybe. Pittsburgh maybe, but I think most likely Miami on the other side. All righty. Yeah. I think either Clemson or NC State win the conference. Okay. That's what my next question was. Cool. There's your ACC preview. Uh, next week, we'll have the SEC. And we're on to the Big Ten, baby. And then we're in football season. Um, there was something I was going to say. Oh, there's going to be NFL preseason games this weekend. Start um, Thursday. Yep. Do I care more about NFL preseason than Summer League? A little, but only a very See, because little. Because it's only three games now, the all four weeks used to bother me. Like, I'd watch the first two. Yeah. And then, I because the last game was like a dress rehearsal, mm-hmm. I'd watch some of it, but I like that it's just three weeks. Well, and like the Lions this weekend, uh, they play they Friday. Play, they play the Falcons. They're Friday. playing the Falcons, which... The Mariota two, Falcons. Two, two fun young teams, I think, yeah. in, in my get, opinion. Get to see the first glimpse of Desmond Ritter. Kyle Pitts yeah. uh, in year two. Drake London. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been hearing good things out about Tyler Algier, too, uh, out of camp. So, just some fun young teams. They're not going to be very good <laughs> in the regular season, but... The Falcons are going to be the worst. Preseason? The worst. Yeah. Falcons could have some highlights, but, um, yeah, they're going to be bad. All righty. Like I said, next week, SEC, we'll add any little news or notes. We'll recap episode two of Hard Knocks. But 
For now, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. So you're still not drinking the blue Kool-Aid? Try not to. Stay reasonable, please. These fans are getting out of control. Drink responsibly. Too much. <laughs> <laughs>